things first. I'm Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. Like he is every day, this is Nick Wright. Happy Monday, everyone. How's everybody's weekend? It's great. I was in Houston. A little anniversary, a little basketball. Happy a little belated anniversary. Oh, I saw you some much. of your fine social media posts. You look like a very happy couple. A good time back in the place we lived for a while and got to see the team that looks like the best basketball team in the world. You guys look amazing Rockets. today. We are very Christine well coordinated. And Danielle got us going today on a Monday. And yeah. very good. CC, though, you're wearing a black suit. Why? Oh, the funeral. Oh, oh it's a funeral. Yes. You're in mourning for, for whom? Uh, the calves. Oh, a funeral the for the king and the calves. Calves. What else do you wear a black suit for? Oh, uh, well, that's I didn't know. I didn't know if it was a wake, a funeral, if we were or just a bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah, yeah. yeah could I be. do that. I'm I'm, I'm available. Oh, <laughs> oh, certified. <laughs> yes. you can do bar, for yeah. entertainment. Yes. Bar Absolutely. mitzvahs, yes. Marriage and funerals. Instead, <laughs> you've decided you're we wearing black some today. Dirt. For <laughs> we don't do that at our minutes. <laughs> LeBron James. So game one of round one of the NBA playoffs is Let's go. in the books. Biggest takeaway besides the fact that I was able to watch 300 uninterrupted hours of basketball this weekend. The takeaway, LeBron James. Cavs and Pacers, and despite a triple-double from LeBron, the Pacers blew the doors off of Cleveland. 98-80, to Victor Oladipo with a game-high 32 points. It was LeBron's first loss in round one in almost six years. The Cavs' first round one loss in eight years. And LeBron's first playoff opening loss ever. So, LeBron James, are you worried? I've always stayed even killed with the postseason. That's just, I mean, I just, I mean, I'm down 0-1 in the first round. I'm so, I'm the last guy to ask about how you're going to feel the next couple of days. It's a good answer, and he's right. CC, what was your, what, what do you think went wrong, really, for Cleveland yesterday? Well, first, Cleveland didn't have a plan B. When their three-point shots were not going, they didn't have an answer. And, you know, uh, this is what we saw during the regular season. We saw a team that's not very, very athletic, a team that does not rebound the basketball well, a team that's not very good on the defensive end, and then also the injuries. I mean, are they healthy? Like, how healthy is Kyle Korver right now? How healthy is George Hill? How healthy is Rodney Hood? Because to me, what I saw for four quarters was what I had been seeing for, what, 40 games, 30 games? I could say 82 games, but the cast and characters, they changed a couple of times. But this was the Cleveland team that I th saw during the season. This was the reason why I said, I'm not overreacting. I said she, Cleveland was not a championship team. You could see that in round number one, losing at home, losing the home court advantage. So I'm not surprised. I'm just surprised that they didn't have a plan B. I watched the Boston game before the Cleveland game. In Boston, they were struggling offensively. They struggled all, but you could see Brad Stevens, he went to a couple sets to get them low post looks. When he wanted to get a bucket or at least get a good look to get them to the free throw line, I didn't see that from the Cavs. I didn't see a counterpoint to what um, the Pacers were doing. So I'm not surprised because this is what I saw uh, for at least half the season. What's surprising to me, most surprising, other than the loss, listen, LeBron hadn't lost a first-round game since 2013 to the Knicks when J.R. Smith was a Nick, and we were at the tail end or the beginning of President Obama's second term. It's been quite some time, right? Or the, so I was, I was surprised they lost. The fashion in which they lost was extra surprising. If you told me the Cavs were going to lose to the Pacers, I would have thought, okay, they lose 125-118. They can't get any stops. Mm -hmm. Their defense was – their defense was not good. Nothing the Cavs did yesterday was good. But the defense was fine. The defense was actually better than we'd seen it during the regular season. Their offense was – You give up 33 points in the first quarter. Cor correct. The, the, then 65 the rest of the way. But their fir <laughs> the first quarter was a disaster on all ends. And the first quarter cost them the basketball game. But the defense, I can't say defense is why they lost. I think it's what CeCe mentioned. Their offensive plan was clearly hit threes or have LeBron bail us out. And that's the part, that second part, because they will hit threes at some point. They're not going to shoot 24% from three. They're not going to go eight for 34 from three again. The, the concerning part, I'm going to talk about LeBron for a second, and I'm going to say some names. Victor Oladipo, mm. James Harden, Paul George, Giannis, Anthony Davis. It's five guys, all of whom were better than LeBron this opening playoff weekend. For the Cavs to have any shot to do what I believed all year they're going to do, make the finals, 
and be competitive in the finals. LeBron has to be so clearly the best or the worst, second best, depending on how Harden's doing, player in this postseason. Like, it's, it's hard to criticize a guy who had a triple-double, but this was a C game from LeBron James when his team needed an A triple-plus game. And when after the first quarter, CC, when they, they cut it to seven and the Pacers were wobbly, that was a moment where if LeBron could have taken over the game for a stretch right there, then all of a sudden you would have said they stole one. They got away with it again. Mm -hmm. Another huge deficit they overcame. But this team's gotten too comfortable being down enormous amounts of points early. The 17-point fourth quarter comeback against the Wizards emboldened them. And then the near 30-point comeback against the Sixers, I believe, made them feel like, okay, we can always, we can throttle on off, forget regular season to postseason, within one game. And they tried to do that, and credit to the Pacers. The Pacers wouldn't let them finish it. And credit to Victor Oladipo, yeah. who was extraordinary yesterday. You said that the Cavs came into this game and didn't have a plan B, and you said the plan was hit threes and then let LeBron bail us out. That's been their plan the whole season. They never had a plan B because plan A was always working. Try to hit threes, try to find mm -hmm. a, a group of guys that can do it, and if all else fails, have LeBron bail us out. So I'm not sure they – I mean, what is plan B if plan A, which has worked this whole time, it, isn't working? It, it's got to be for the role players to play better. You, you, you got, you're going to get better productivity from Jeff Green, from Rodney Hood, and from George Hill. Like, those guys have to make a contribution. Also, when you went to this type of lineup, you went to it because it was younger. Like, they were able to get younger. So, if you're going to play that lineup, you have to play with some type of pace. Uh, LeBron uh, got to the bucket only one time. You can say, uh, officially, unofficially, he had one dunk in the game. All right, so when, you, when you're seeing the Cavs and they're only playing a half-court set, it is not set up for them to make that kind of contribution that they need. But they're not going anywhere unless they have those other players make some contributions, make some shots, and get some stops defensively. And LeBron's got to hit some jump shots. LeBron, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know if it was a lack of confidence in the jump shot. I don't know, I don't know what was going on. But he hit zero shots outside of the paint. Like, this was... If you remove the game against the Celtics last year, game four, when he got in the very early foul trouble, four first-half fouls, this was the worst. It's odd because he had 24-point triple-double. This was the worst playoff game LeBron's played in three years. Like, we don't see mediocre LeBron James playoff games. And the team wasn't ready. The plan B they could have had, Jenna, was get Kevin Love posted up a few times. Try to get Kevin Love a few easy baskets. He made three shots. They were all three-pointers. Yeah, it's hard to play in the post in the playoffs, as you could see. And, and, and there was no one who could have a, 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 a consistent post presence in all the NBA games. So let alone Kevin Love, who's an undersized five. They tried to get Kevin Love started. I mean, he, got, he took four of the first five shots yep. in the game. They tried to get him going offensively. He didn't. He couldn't make a bucket. So I, I don't think Kevin Love in the post is something they can depend on, um, given the physicality of NBA basketball in the playoffs. Are you worried about this team heading into game two? Um, I've been worried about them all year. I think it means for this series. Are you worried about them for this series? Well, this is what the totality of it. I believe they will they will win this series, but they're going to lo lose a couple games. And the totality of it and LeBron, how that will play out in the rest of the playoffs. So we should be concerned because we have seen this Cavs team play a lot like this during the regular season. And let's not forget about the bright lights of the playoffs. A lot of these guys don't have a whole bunch of playoff experience. So we were talking about, oh, what will they do in the playoffs? Well, the playoffs is here. And our first edition of it was not good. Well, it, listen, I, I don't want to overreact. Because eventually LeBron was going to lose a round one game, right? The 21 straight was a record. Eventually he was going to lose a first game to start a playoffs, which he had never done his entire career. And eventually, maybe one day, he might actually lose a first round series in which he's an NBA record 12-0. and 0. So I don't want to overreact to this. But what I will say is the Cavs are now in a position they have not been in since game three of last year's finals. A must-win game. You can't go down 0-2 at home. You can't go down 0-2 when you're the team with home court advantage, when you don't have a championship roster, a bunch of guys. You saw in there, you know who actually played well for a little bit? JR. JR. Like yes. some, you saw Tristan, who's one of the few guys. And provided some energy defensively. Provided some energy. And that's the, the one other point I want to make on this, that the Cavs are going to realize the tough spot they're in, I believe, in the Eastern Conference Finals against Philly. 
they don't have a lineup that has athletic defenders and knockdown shooters. They are choosing either or. You want Corver out there for the shooting, yes. you're sacrificing defensively. You want Jeff Green out there for his length defensively, you're sacrificing in the shooting. And we saw that Jeff Green missed two open corner threes, one to, at the end of the third mm -hmm. quarter that could have cut it to five, and one during the run in the fourth quarter. Right. They, they made that choice to have him in there. That's a sacrifice you, they're making. I think Jeff Green's going to play better. He has. I think he will be dependable. But what I'm worried about is the injury. Rodney Hood, he's nicked up. George Hill, he went out of the game eight minutes in the third quarter after a pick um, that he caught in the backcourt. His overall health and um, Cal Cor Corver's foot. Three minutes. Yeah, his, his foot. You could tell it was bothering him. That's why they couldn't go back to him. So those injuries um, is something that we should watch. All right, so the Cavaliers drop game one. Game two now slated for Wednesday night between the Cavs and the Pacers. Coming up, talk some football. Des Bryant and the Cowboys finally broke up. We discuss the fallout next on the first okay. This is the First Things First podcast, the episode brought to you by 4 It's time to discuss an issue that you may not want to hear. 66% of men lose their hair by age 35. But good news, it's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace what you lost. How will you feel a year from now if there are bald spots creeping up? Well, here are your options. Do you want a bald spot to pop up or your hairline to recede? Or do you want to do something about it first? This is where 4 comes in. It is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and an overall helpful product for men. That's right. Thanks to signs, baldness can be optional. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. There are no waiting rooms or weird doctor visits down a back alley. Just go to 4 and take action today. It is so easy. Products will be brought right to your door. Here's how to do it. Order now. Listeners get a trial month of hymns for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash first. That's 4 F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash first. 4 com slash first. All right, hey, you guys here with the Cowboys ended up doing with Des Bryant. You remember after weeks of will they or won't they ask him to take a pay cut, you know, because of his production cut the last few seasons, the Cowboys instead just let him go. Cowboys all-time leader in touchdown receptions was none too pleased, as you'd imagine. Reportedly, the meeting between Jerry Jones and Des Bryant took just 20 minutes. Bryant said that the, quote, Jason Garrett guys were partially to blame for the Cowboys letting him go. But Des doesn't blame Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, he loved me to death, and I love him too. I honestly, be, I honestly believe in my heart. You know, this was a hard decision for him, but you know, um, it's when it's five or six guys at a table against one guy, you got to do it. This situation was very unfair to me, and I put it that way. It was, it was an unfair situation, you know, because you know, if they did want to, you know, get rid of me, they could have told me that. You know, they could have told me that, and. I would respect that. All right, Cece, what, what was your reaction to how everything went down? We discussed this ad nauseum the last couple weeks, and one of the scenarios that I don't think we really discussed at all was that they were just going to let him go. Well, I knew there was a walk-away point. Um, I, I was surprised that they weren't able to negotiate because anytime, typically when an owner sets up a meeting like that, you feel as if you're going to have some type of input. But the one thing, if I was Dez, it was in Dez's shoes, when Jerry came into the meeting by himself, I would have been alarmed. That would have set off an alarm with me. Hey, there's no one. The cap guy's not here. <laughs> I mean, the general manager's not here. Because if we are going to negotiate my salary down, there has to be some type of incentive package. I know Jerry Jones is not communicating that to the players. So, to me, I, that right there, it, it sent off an alert. And then it also told me that it's obvious they don't want Dez Bryant in the building at no salary. I mean, they picked the – now, Dez would say, oh, they could have done it sooner. They picked, I mean, the time to cut him that it was most penal for the team. Like, they could have waited until June. He could have been a, a post-June 1st cut, which they could have gotten calorie, um, salary cap relief. But it lets me know they didn't want him in the building. And whatever effect that he has on Dak, they don't believe that to be positive. So there was no negotiating. 
Like, I thought the day would come to a settlement. He would get some incentives where he could earn some of the money back, and he would stay in Dallas for one more year. So that part right there was surprising that the Dallas Cowboys and their organization, that they totally gave up on Des Bryant. This, the timing is what's baffling. Because I, the, you can cut a guy before June 1st and just designate him post June 1st, and then you can split the salary cap, the, the salary, the dead money hit. They're, they're going to take the whole dead money this year. They evidently wanted to do that. But if you're going to cut him, what, what was the delay? Because the owner clearly has affection for Des Bryant. So for the player, it would have been right. better to be cut earlier when teams still have a lot of cap space. And for the Cowboys, do they maybe get, instead of in the Allen Hearn sweepstakes, in the Allen Robinson sweepstakes? Well, do in, in talking to someone who's close to the situation, um, they really wanted Sammy Watkins. That was their number one choice, all right? They weren't able to land him. If they would have signed him, then they would have cut Dez. And they also, um, Allen Robinson, mm -hmm. they were interested in his service. He ended up signing um, with Chicago. So... I just believe the timing of it, their interest there, those guys going elsewhere, they had made up their mind that now was the time to do it. The, the, the part that's just confusing about that is if you know, okay, we want Allen Robinson or Sammy Watkins, but if we don't get them, at least we have Dez. Then I understand holding on to him, but you didn't get them. And then and you, you still didn't. cut him. So, like, they obviously would have cut him if they would have gotten one of those guys. If they cut him without getting one of those guys. The part of this that I don't think Dez, that I... What I would guess is, is that a pay cut was at least floated earlier, not in this meeting, but earlier in the offseason yes. to the agent, to Des. Mm -hmm. And I texted you this. I was like, the agent went to the Nick Wright School of Negotiating, which was bleep you, no. I dare you to cut me. And you've been saying for weeks, you do that, they might cut you. Yeah, you can do that in Major League Hockey. You can do that in <laughs> baseball. You can do that in the NBA. All you right. can't tell them to cut you in the NFL. Because the way the contracts are stipulated, they will walk away from it. I thought there would be a walkaway number from Dallas, but I didn't think they would get to that number. How much of this is, is because of on-the-field stuff? I mean, there are rumors floating out there that he didn't have a great relationship, on-field relationship with Dak, that it just wasn't working, that chemistry, that he was resentful towards some of the, the captains on the team, some of the, the, the long-standing players that have been there for a while, that he had some issues with Jason Garrett. And then there's what he actually did on the field, because if it was just on the field stuff, then you're right. Why not give him an incentive package where he can make all the money by just getting out there and producing? Well, I think there's just too many negatives. In this new NFL, you can't have three bad seasons the way Dez did. Typically, you have one bad season, you're a star player, they come to you and ask for some type of reduction. He had three of those bad seasons, so you have to calculate how much better is the player going to be. And to me, this is a team that's not built around them throwing the ball. It's built around that offensive line, which they've made a major investment in and will continue to make investments in, in, in extend um, the, key, the key components to that offensive line. Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott. So for me, this was a message that this team is being turned over to this younger team for the style for which they're going to play. And I believe that the emotional effect that Dez had on Dak on game day, it led to the decision with the Dallas um, deciding to release Dez. I think that? that, well, that's that for some reason they believed there were what we would call non-football reasons, but f reasons that do affect football. So it's not just production. It is about whatever, what CeCe's alluding to, that, th that they thought he had a negative effect either in the locker room or on the quarterback in particular, because otherwise, moving on from him, is perplexing because they are, I understand he has not lived up to his contract the last three years, but the Dallas Cowboys are worse today than they were Thursday. You are still better in 2018 with Des Bryant than with ephemeral cap space that, like, there's not even a lot of good players left to sign. And the Cowboys, what's the window I talk about all the time? The best window, it's, it's, there's two categories in the NFL. Do you have a quarterback on a rookie pay scale? Do you not? They're going into year three of what will only be four years of Dak on this rookie pay scale. They just took at least a slight step backwards in the skill position area. They must have thought they could overcome that. One of those huge things is if Dez end up getting hurt in the offseason workouts, his whole salary would be guaranteed, and they would be stuck. So that's have to be. With Dez's injury history, you have to look at him getting hurt and his contract being guaranteed. I think that played the role in Dallas deciding um, to release him. We will discuss this more, and we'll get into the DAC angle also in a little bit. But coming up, the late game last night, the Rockets. How did Chris Paul almost blow the game for Houston? Next on First Things First. All right, finally, the Thunder beat the 
Jazz in game one, 116-108. Paul George was the star for OKC, dropping 36 in his playoff debut for the Thunder. Nick, how dangerous are the Thunder when Paul George plays like this? Well, listen, I picked Utah to win this series in no small part because I didn't think you'd get a Paul George game like this. Paul George, if we remember, he was having the best three-point shooting season of his career. Then all of a sudden, something happened. He was shooting less than 25% for over a month, and he said something had gone wrong with his mechanics. Man, whatever was going wrong with his mechanics, he fixed it. At least for a day, he did. 8 of 11 from 3. I thought the Thunder could have tried to get him the record. I think Klay Thompson has it with 11 threes. He, he got his 8-3 early in the fourth quarter, I believe. They had time there. I... He was outstanding, and Russ played within himself. Russ had a couple bad possessions at the end of the game when Utah almost stole it from him. But Russ played within himself, and Paul George was a superstar in this basketball game. And, I mean, it overcame. Donovan Mitchell played well. His playoff debut, 27 points, 50% shooting. Like, this was an excellent, important win for OKC. It was nice to see the contributions because we said at the beginning of the season with two superstars being Paul George and Russell like they would be a dangerous team. This is kind of one of the few times that we've seen them operate together. Now I disagree with you a little bit because Russ had 25 shots. That's still too many shots for your point guard especially when Paul George was on fire like they should have went to Paul George even more like I mean he went off on him in the first half like I, I thought this was going to be a 40 point game so R Russ relatively speaking he was under control but 25 shots from your point guard when you got a guy who was on fire it's too many. so yeah, it, it's still too many shots so moving forward how do they utilize Paul George how do they how did, did they run more sets for him and his overall confidence it's got to be booming after what he did in game one because that Paul George we hadn't seen for a couple months no it was great and it was the your point on Russ I understand it I they were I mean, this was an 18-point game with less than four minutes left. Like, the Thunder had taken over, so I wasn't as bothered by Russ in the moment, in the flow of things, trying to get his shots up. But I understand what you're saying, which is there was especially a stretch in the game where it seemed like Paul George could not miss yes. and just feed him until he starts missing. He was – if you make eight three-pointers, you probably should take 16. You know what I mean? Like, he was 8 of 11. It, it, give him a chance to miss a few in a row. I understand your point mm -hmm. there. But that was a very important win. Because I think Utah might be the more – not the more talented team, but the team that had played better throughout the year. Yes. Given their level of talent, mm -hmm. given the fact that how good they were when, when Rudy Gobert came back, they were one of the best teams in the league. So that was an important win that I didn't think the Thunder were going to get. All right, let's move on to the Rockets taking on the Timberwolves last night. This one closer than Houston would have liked. They did pull it out behind a casual 44 out of James Harden. Chris Paul struggled boy scored only 14 points and making critical turnovers down the stretch Nick let's start with the positive though how impressive was James Harden's performance in game one made all those people that voted for him for MVP feel real good because James Harden this was a game that Trevor Reza couldn't hit a shot PJ Tucker couldn't hit a shot mm -hmm. Chris Paul forget the end of the game where he had the terrible turnover I know we'll get to that but Chris Paul was struggling Chris Paul's not always going to score a lot of points, but he never turns the ball over half a dozen times. Like, that's going on. Eric Gordon only had a few shots out of ten taken. But you, why did it not matter? Because James Harden, who's been one of the three best players in basketball over the last four years and was had the best season of anyone this year, James Harden was unguardable. I don't know how you guard that step-back three. It seems like a bad shot. For almost anyone else in the league, it's a... It's a forced shot. It's a shot you're like, okay, we're glad we made him take that shot. And he makes it at such a high rate. He has a higher shooting percentage on the step back three than the spot up three, which seems impossible. There's, with his length, and all of a sudden, he's also in better shape, if you've noticed. Like, he's always been a thick guy, but he's a little more defined. He can play at big minutes like he always has, but play them at a high intensity level on both ends. Like, Harden was spectacular. That is what your MVP of the league is supposed to do in game one of the playoffs against a dangerous eight seed. Especially if the rest of your team isn't stepping up. Absolutely. Yes, and he shoots the ball better off the dribble. That's the reason for the percentage with, with the step back. And it's a, it's a, it is a lethal weapon that he's added. His dribbling skills are phenomenal. His, ball, his ability to be able to get past a defender and get to the hoop, you know, that is another reason why he's special. He's a lot like... Um, say Steph Curry off the dribble compared to Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson's a better stationary shooter. Catch and shoot. Um, yes. So you see that with Harden. It, it was nice to see the best player in the NBA. 
like it to be rewarded because there's a lot of pressure in Houston. I know uh, the, the coach says, oh, it's not, it doesn't matter what we do in the postseason. Last night showed that it, it really does. And like this team needs experience together. So what I take from it is uh, a contested against a good team that was well prepared. They understood what they were trying to do. They didn't let Houston play at the pace that they wanted to. They knew the sets that they were running. So defensively, um, uh, Tibbs there in Minnesota, he had them prepared for this game. Now, they didn't make shot. It is a make shot, miss shot league, as we saw with Cleveland, Houston. But Houston's superstar stepped up to be able to save the day. That was one of the big differences between who Houston is right now and who Cleveland is. When you say make or miss shots, I mean non-hardened non Rockets were 5 of 25 from 3. Mm -hmm. That's a game they're supposed to lose when all those other guys played the way they did. Before we, before we move on to anything else on it, though, I do want to mention one name we haven't said. Your guy, CeCe, the guy who KD says has an easy job, Clint Capella. Yes. Clint Capella outplayed Carl Anthony Towns. I, like, Big yes. Cat is awesome. Mm -hmm. I love him as a player. Clint Capella ate his lunch yesterday, and Clint Capella was the only other Rocket other than Harden that you saw and were like, oh, he's he's playing an A-plus level game, and they needed every bit of it on the defensive end, and you don't expect to get 24 points from Clint Capella in any basketball game. It was critical because they weren't hitting their outside shots. The knock on the Rockets has been what? When they get to the playoffs, mm -hmm. they're going to fall apart. That's what is, is that mm -hmm. besides what happened with James Harden, is that what happened last night to the rest of the team, do you think? Does, does that play into it at all? Well, I just believe playoff experience playing together, it helps. When you're when the ball's not going in, it's hard for me to draw some other conclusion as far as nerves or anything. Like these guys are great shooters. All right. They play offense at a at a clip that we have never seen as far as far as their efficiency. This was just an off night. Their superstar stepped up. Capella stepped up because that's the reason why they're so dangerous. They have off shooting night. They can still beat you. What I told you, even though they play at a fast pace, I love the way they close out games now better than ever before. Chris Paul it used to be one-two punch with him and Harden. Harden took over that fourth quarter because he knew he didn't have that 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 that. Um, Chris Paul playing at his best there at the end. And listen, the, the, the knock is going to be the way they almost lost. That Chris Paul it, it inexplicably throws the ball away 70 feet up court when he's a great free throw shooter. All he has to do at the end of the game is hold on to the ball. Mm -hmm. I understand you might want to toss it up to Eric Gordon, but you only make that pass if you absolutely have to. Oh, and by the way, the Rockets had a couple timeouts. Like, there was no reason to make that mistake. Here's what I think happened to Chris Paul to a degree, because we saw a similar but much, much worse, and it cost him game five against the Thunder, I believe, in 2014 in the Western Conference semifinals, where Chris Paul in the backcourt, similar place on the court, they were trying to foul him. Mm -hmm. He tried to bait them into a three-point foul, and they ended up turning <laughs> the ball over and losing the game. I, Chris Paul and LeBron James are very, very close. They have a similarity about them in this regard. They're both such high IQ thoughtful basketball players that at times you feel like at the end of games they are overthinking things at the end of games they are trying to do a little too much instead of doing the obvious thing the fact that they won that game despite CP3 not playing well the fact that they won that game despite CP3 making a huge mental error at the end I think could be enormous for him moving forward he's never been in a position even with peak Blake Chris where he can play poorly in a playoff game against a good team, and one of his teammates can go do that and take care of him. He, he didn't play well, and he had a huge error at the end, and they still won the game. I, I wonder if that's a hurdle he's now gotten over, and I guess we'll see it as the playoffs move on. All right, let's take a break. Coming up, how are the Dallas Cowboys going to replace Dez's production on the field? That is next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. Chris Kenny's with us. Chris Kenny spent Good all man, weekend here in New York playing golf, wanting to play golf, trying I, to play golf. I didn't actually get a chance did to play around the golf. Did not actually play a round of But golf. I did get out to Top Golf, had a little fun out there nice. down Practice. in New Jersey. It was good. It was good. I like it. Enjoy. Yeah, exactly. It's good to have you in this morning on this rainy day. You got the golf in the I know, weather. right? We nice. had some golf weather this weekend, yep. Friday and Saturday, and all of a sudden that uh, changed. Opposite of golf yes. weather today. Anytime, Spring. We're waiting on you. Anytime. <laughs> we're skipping Spring. I think we're going right to summer. <laughs> you know, for weeks we've been anticipating the big Dallas Cowboys meeting between Jerry Jones and Des Bryant. The will he or won't he take a pay cut to remain a cowboy? Guess what? In the end, the answer was neither. 
The Cowboys' all-time leader in touchdown receptions is a Cowboy no longer. The 20-minute meeting didn't sit well with Dez, as you might imagine. Brian said that the, quote, Jason Garrett guys were partially to blame for the Cowboys letting him go, but Dez doesn't blame the man in charge. Jerry Jones, he loved me to death, and I love him too. I honestly, be, I honestly believe in my heart. You know, this was a hard decision for him, but, you know, um, it's, when it's five or six guys at a table against one guy, you got to do it. This situation was very unfair to me, and I'll put it that way. It was, it was an unfair situation, you know, because you know, if they did want to, you know, get rid of me, they could have told me that. You know, they could have told me that, and I would have respected that. All right, Chris Kenny. What does this mean now for the Dallas Cowboys moving forward? Were you surprised? I was surprised. This? I thought it made more sense from a football perspective for the Dallas Cowboys to keep Des Bryant. But I will say this. The way that things went down, it wasn't solely a football decision. It might have been spurred by the money and the economics of the business with that $16.5 million cap number. But I think there were some people in the building that were uncomfortable with Des Bryant. And they felt like we would be able to move forward with Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott being the identity of the team. And those are the faces of the franchise from a leadership standpoint. So I think that's exactly what's happening here. I think there are a couple of different layers to the issue. But Des Bryant is absolutely right in his criticism of the Dallas Cowboys. And when they got rid of him, the timing of it is all wrong. You should have gave him an opportunity to get a chance to get some of that money at the top of the free agent market. But by waiting about a month after free agency opens to release him, I just felt like that was a little unfair to Dez. Well, and even if you don't care if it's unfair to Dez or not, it's not the right move for your football team. With the, the, I'm not saying cutting him is not the right move, but there is no benefit to cutting him now as opposed to a month and a half ago. None. Yes. Like, and it, people say sometimes indecision is worse than the wrong decision. It seems to me the only logical reason that they would have waited this long to cut him, if they weren't negotiating about money, and if they're, it's not like they signed some major free agent. I know they signed Alan Hearns, but he's on the top of the market no. free agent. Is if there was an argument or disagreement within the organization essentially I would imagine Jerry Jones wanting to keep him other power whether it be the coach the quarterback the uh, top players on the team not wanting him and eventually the latter group won out because had you made this move six weeks ago could the Cowboys have been in the market I don't know for the Brandon Cooks trade like they have a better pick to give up than Los Angeles they are in the window right now where Dak Prescott is so cheap that you have the ability to add that type of player like they I just I don't understand the timing of it. And what I will say is this. The Cowboys have a quarterback making less than a million dollars. That is your time to win this moment. Here pretty soon, they don't, only have to, they don't only have to give their quarterback a new contract. They got to give their running back a new contract. That's going to make it harder to upgrade a defense that needs upgrading. It's going to make it harder to hold on to those three all-pro offensive linemen. And so to take a step backwards when you are in your championship window is foolhardy to me. So, CeCe, I'll ask you this then. Are the Cowboys better off this morning than they were a week ago? Well, when you don't want someone in the building, because that was the statement that they made. We don't want to take the chance of him getting hurt in the offseason workouts. We're willing to take that hit right now. Are they better off? This is what they wanted to do. Are they like, a better team, though? With who I, they have now? Dez just hadn't been productive. Like, we can sit here and talk about who he used to be, but he hadn't been productive. So, does it make their quarterback better? Because when you make decisions like this, it's not only a wide receiver decision. Like you said, it's off the field. And I believe it was how Dez treated and interacted with the quarterback, I believe, affected them wanting to keep him. That's the reason why I believe ultimately why Jerry lost out in this deal. Because the quarterback has not gotten better. And... How many years are they going to have their star wide receiver yelling or unhappy on the sideline? It's something that gets old. Now, when you're getting 1,200, 1,400 yards, they're willing to tolerate that. That's what they're doing with the Giants. But when you're like Dez and you've had three subpar seasons, those aren't things that the team is looking to move forward with. I believe it affected Dak. I believe the coaches and the administration there, they communicated that with Jerry, that we're better off moving forward. So, this is what they think. They think they're better. So I'm not going to question. They're there working with the team. So if Dallas thinks they're better, 
I think they're better. Yeah, it has to be a situation where they feel like it's addition by subtraction. And, CC, you're absolutely right. You don't get the benefit of the doubt when you're not producing on the field. And Des Bryant really hasn't been productive as a wide receiver. And if it, if it had been an injury or an athletic thing, Chris, don't you think Jerry or the general manager or someone else would have been in the room? Because to me, it set off a red flag when Jerry came to the meeting by himself. Yeah. You know, and if it was just about performance, we could talk about that it. That is, cap guy's not there, that nobody's there to talk about incentives. That was Chris's point. When Jerry walks in by himself, you know you're getting cut, essentially. Yeah, essentially, that's exactly what went down. That's what I was saying. That was my earlier point. Mm -hmm. The fact that there was no attempt yeah. to restructure or to try to work some situation out to lower the cap hit, that just clearly signals to me that the Dallas Cowboys, some of the players, some of the coaches, did not want him in the building any longer. To me, it just seems like it's a little unfair to treat your all-time touchdown receptions leader the way that they've treated Dez by not releasing him at the beginning of free agency and giving him an opportunity to find a, a landing spot. Like, I understand the argument that teams want to make in saying that we needed time to go through the pre-draft mm -hmm. process and the off-season cycle to be able to find viable options to potentially replace the production. <clears throat> but to me, it just seems unfair to Des Bryant in this situation where he could have been one of the receivers at the top of the free agent market. I, I also want to talk about whether or not it was ever realistic with the Cowboys as presently constituted that Dez was going to recapture anything close to what he had in years three, four, and five. Because that was the prime of his career. That was when he was one of the three or four best receivers in the league. So those were also years three, four, and five, the last three healthy years of Tony Romo. Year six, Dez was hurt and Romo was hurt. Year seven, Dak took over. Year eight, Romo's gone and Dak is the quarterback. Those were the three years that Dez was not productive. The last two, healthy. I want to then add to that what we learned from watching Tony Romo on television this year. Tony Romo is an outstanding communicator. Tony Romo is great about telling you what's going on, what he's seeing, what you're seeing. And then I'm going to talk about what Chris has... And he's also saying that the people who don't have the type of football IQ. So he's also speaking a language that people can understand, even though he speaks a different football language. Well, that, you, you finished my thought. Because one thing I, that you've explained to me about Dez is that Dez, for all of his gifts, is not necessarily the most sophisticated football player. Dez is not a guy that can line up in multiple spots. Dez is not a guy that can run a whole variety of routes. So is it possible in your eyes that part of the lack of production from Dez wasn't necessarily just an athleticism dropping off, but he had a quarterback who was also playing translator to a degree. Yes. And then you had a rookie. You had In year six, you had backup quarterbacks in there. Year seven, you had a rookie quarterback in there who's not able to play translator the way Tony Romo did for us on television this year because Romo talks about football and shows it. I've watched football with you, and I've listened to Romo. Yep. And for guys that have that level of football IQ, they can explain Explain it to people that don't fully understand it. And so how much of that do you think is what was going on? I think Tony Romo made Des Bryant. I think Tony Romo made him the receiver. Now, people want to say, well, oh, Dez made all these athletic plays. Look at how good Dez and Tony were when the plays were off schedule, which we talked about earlier, Jenna. When Tony Romo was scrambling, Dez Bryant would be able to ad lib with the best of them. I believe that Tony Romo, his ability to be able to explain the offense and what he wanted Dez to do, it helped, and when he got to Dak, he had to go backwards because Dak, the way he sees football and plays football, is totally different than Tony Romo. Now, us being blessed as, as football fans with Tony Romo, very seldom are you able to see a guy who's able to leave the football field and communicate, Chris, what's actually going on and why things are happening, and sometimes before they happen, in real time. The way football players see it, the way you watch film and everything, so for me, I could see the disconnect. So from Tony Romo, from the time he started falling off, that th that period also you could see where Dez started to fall off. Yeah, you know what? It's just one of those situations where you clearly don't have the production from that receiver position. The pay scale is a little bit off with production with Dez Bryant. They're moving on now. For, but for me, I don't know where the Dallas Cowboys go to try to replace that production because what they have on their roster right now just isn't good enough to get Dak Prescott back on track. Right, and not the heaviest draft class as far as wide receivers go. Yeah. No. All right, Chris, stick no. around. Coming up, how concerned should the Patriots be that Gronk is still considering retirement every day? That's next on First Things First. Back here on First Things First with Chris Canny. The Patriots are 
getting the gang back together for practice this week. You know, like almost all the other teams in the league are doing this week. They don't take attendance, but if they did, two notable absent. Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski. Tom Brady oversees in Qatar with his family. Not a big deal. Qatar is really pretty this time of year. Gronk, however, still considering whether or not he's playing in 2018. That one a little bit of a bigger deal. Chris Kenny, what's your reaction to the news that Gronk is not showing up at practice this week? To me, it sounds like Gronkowski is looking for a contract. He's looking for an extension oh. on what he currently has right now because he's going back and forth. <laughs> he's been waffling the entire offseason, not sure if he's going to retire, not sure if he's going to come back. Now, I do believe a part of this equation is that the act from Bill Belichick has worn a little thin in, in his eyes. But in terms of Gronkowski not showing up, he's got a $250,000 workout bonus in his contract if he makes 90% of the offseason workouts. And the fact that he's not showing up on day one, to me, that shows that He's willing to forego that quarter million dollar workout bonus if he can somehow, some way, get the organization to be amenable to giving him a contract extension because he's looking at the disparity in pay in terms of what the number one receiving options are, are getting yeah. on respective teams in the NFL. Top of the market receivers are getting $16, 17000000 million a year. Sammy Watkins signed with the Kansas City Chiefs for $16 million a year. And Rob Gronkowski is going to work for a little bit less than $9 million bucks over the next couple of seasons? <sighs> It just doesn't sit right with me. It probably doesn't sit right with him in his camp, and that's probably why he's doing what he's doing, trying to angle and get a new contract from the Patriots. I, I want to focus on the Brady side of this just for a second to see if you guys find it as noteworthy as I do. Tom Brady's not there for day one of the offseason program? Since when does that happen? I understand there's a family obligation, maybe a charity obligation. Like, he got a work obligation. And while I know not everybody goes to all the off-season workouts, and some guys traditionally don't go to the off-season workouts, I know, CeCe, you talked about that there was a time in your career where there was a certain set of the OTAs that you never went to. You would always be working out on your own. Mm -hmm. But whenever someone does something different than how they've done it for 18 consecutive years, I find it noteworthy. We've never heard, I've never remember a story about Tom Brady not being there. For day one, now I know Belichick's quote was, I've talked to the players, I understand it. Mm -hmm. It's still odd to me. Now, it, before, so that's why I said I want to start with that before you get to the Gronk stuff. Like, am I, do you think I'm overreacting to the Brady stuff? You're overreacting. It would be odd for Brady to be there. Like, there's nothing new. Like, if you want to keep Tom Brady playing, you have to be able to extend some things to be able to keep him interested in what you're trying to put. I mean, the first day is not important at all. And I'm not 100% certain that Brady has been there every time for the first day. We don't – we cover these OTAs and mini camps and off-season workouts totally different than we used to cover them. Okay. Like, so I, I just – I wouldn't be concerned about that at all. And Belichick did say, I've talked to a couple players. They're not going to be here. There's some scheduling conflicts. That's not something I'd be concerned about. Okay, then I saw – then let's go to the Gronk thing because I saw your eyes flicker a bit when – Chris Canty mentioned contract extension and Rob Gronkowski. Like, wh wh where are you at on the Gronk stuff? Well, Gronk, it, when you're playing with someone like Belichick, and we've seen th through players that have left, and Danny Amendola, he did an interview that really gave you some insight into who Bill Belichick is, it can wear on you. And the offseason, when you have a quarter of a million dollars in a workout bonus, that, that's just like... That's just like money left on the side of the road. All you have to do is be at the building 90% of the time. I'm like, telling you. You don't put those types of bonuses in there unless you're going to go get them because you'll be like, no, I don't want that in there as a bonus. Put 50000 in there. Get me another two hundred some other way. When they put that kind of money in there, it lets me know. I believe Gronk is seriously contemplating not playing football. And then in not trying to play football, I believe he doesn't want to be in the Patriots and be at that building as, um, any longer than he's got to be. Mm. You know, man, this football is a hard, hard business. Every if, if they were just playing the games, Chris would still be playing. Hello. Hey, Chris, just show up on Sunday, bro. I need you to play about 30, 40 plays and just wreck havoc. No, it's the mm. other stuff. It's the offseason. That's just, what they pay you for. They pay you for that stuff. Yeah, because I ain't play nobody, the games for free. Yeah, ain't that nobody other stuff, cheering That's for what you. they pay me for. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if ultimately Gronk walked away from the game. You both now mentioned with regards to Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski that maybe Bill Belichick's act or whatever you want to call it is wearing thin. First of all, the season ended for them like eight minutes ago. How how hard is it for guys that have been there under his his director, his tutelage, whatever you want to call it for the last couple of years, to have to turn around that quickly, want to come into camp and want to start fresh with what was sort of just on their mind? Like, could this just be normal? Could this just be fatigue? Or you, you, you really think that he's making a statement here? 
They've been in the Super Bowl a couple of years in a row. So, I mean, it's been a long, long season for those guys, and they really didn't get the recovery time the last couple of off-seasons that most players are accustomed to. So, I can understand them not showing up day one or week one of the off-season program. But when Rob Gronkowski seems like he's going back and forth about this, feels like it's a situation where he wants the Patriots to make it worth his while to continue to his football career. That's why I always go back to the contract issue and him maybe wanting to bump in pay. And, and maybe he also realized, like, life and negotiations are very often about leverage. And I understand players never have leverage over the Patriots, not how they do business. But when we are talking about age 41 Tom Brady, that window winnowing to a degree, you've traded away Brandon Cooks. Danny Amendola's gone. Gronk's probably sitting there thinking, man, I'm about as valuable as I've ever been. I'm coming off a year where I was, for the most part, healthy. I know he had the concussion in the playoff game, but he, he didn't have a knee problem, a shoulder problem. His elbow was healthy throughout the year, healthy enough to do that elbow drop on Tredavious White on the sideline. Like, I, I think I do wonder, because you're right, that Gronk's got a – I know tight ends don't get paid like wide receivers, but Gronk is one of the most talented tight ends and one of the most productive tight ends ever. And he's sitting there saying, I make half the money – of Sammy Watkins, I make 60% of the money as Allen Robinson. Yeah, all those are great conversations for other teams. You on another team, that's a great conversation. Hey, man, I like to get a pay raise. But as long as you got Tom Brady making $14 million, it holds down the salary of all the other players. So I don't care how good y'all think Gronk is. I don't care what kind of offers he's got, all right? They are not going to give Gronk any more money, and Tom Brady's still only making $14 million, though. So Sam, Sammy Watkins making fifteen. million? That don't matter to Bill Belichick and to New England and, and I mean, and, and the rest of the hierarchy there and what they're doing. So that, that's that's nice. It, it's all like it, we all talk this tough talk, but you are Bill Belichick is not going to give him a contract extension. Rob Gronkowski, his only thing is, am I going to play under this new deal or am I going to retire? I believe those are the only two moves that he's got. I will say this, CC, you're probably right in terms of Rob Gronkowski trying to get leverage over the Patriots and Bill Belichick. But you know as a player he probably feels some kind of way knowing that they were in conversations with Brandon Cooks to give him a contract extension. And you know that deal was going to be $14, $15 million a year. Yes. The fact that they're willing to pay a guy that they've only had for one year that kind of money when they won two Super Bowls with Rob Gronkowski, it would frustrate me as a player as well. And let me just ask you this question, though, because you said that you think Gronk is seriously contemplating, actually contemplating retiring. Yes. If the Patriots think that same thing, you don't think they would potentially at least consider going outside slightly the Patriot way? Not because it's one thing of a player you know is coming back is just going to come back unhappy. But if you were trying to dangle a carrot to make sure he does not retire when you need him in what could be the last few years of Tom Brady, you don't think that the, the potential true threat of retirement would be enough for them to change business or at least consider changing business a little bit? You can't threaten Bill Belichick. You can't threaten him. There's nothing you can put over his head. He don't do business that way. All right? It's not going to happen. So I would be shocked by that. I'm Jenna Wolf, and thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Make sure to subscribe and tell your friends, family, and coworkers about the podcast, which, by the way, is available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. You can catch a fresh new episode every Monday through Friday on FS1, starting at 6.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. Pacific. So long.